And in some way, that artifact has the capability of being able to transmit the original experience in some form to the people that are going to see it. And for you as a therapist, because you are both as a, a therapist and a photographer. Yes. So what are you doing when you are taking a photograph, you think? Um, at the moment, what I'm doing when I'm taking a photograph is sort of a bit of self-exploration. Um, but it changes over time. I mean, it depends also on the purpose that, that I've originally charged with taking the photograph. So, for example, a friend of mine asked me to take a picture of some jewellery the other day for his shop. And that was really quite interesting, but I wasn't trying to put you know, or explore myself particularly through it, although various things came out. For example, when you take a picture of a diamond, you can see all the flaws in it when it's you know, magnified to a, to a great scale. And then the decision is, you know, what do you do about that? Do you polish them out in Photoshop or do you keep them in? Or... Magic, psychoanalysis and persuasion. Okay, well... I think I spoke about the magic. I think the original magic is actually seeing the photograph emerge in chemicals. I mean, lots of people don't see that now, but it's a pretty good metaphor for something, form coming out of darkness mm -hmm. um, and being there for the first time. In terms of persuasion, we have to go back to Freud's early history in studying um, psychology. And this experiment that he conducted with Hippolyte Burnham in France, in which a number of people were hypnotized, and then they were told that when they came out of the trance, they were going to open an umbrella indoors, which isn't a normal thing to do. In fact, there's taboos against it in some places. And of all the people that opened the umbrella when they were asked why they did this, they made up some reason. They said they were wanting to look at how the mechanism worked or who the umbrella belonged to or whether the fabric of the umbrella was in good condition. But none of them actually said they'd been hypnotized. And the result of this was that Freud concluded that we carry out actions in life but we don't actually know why we're carrying them out. Having said that, we will, we're perfectly happy to make up stories to explain what we're doing, and then we live out our life according to the stories. So what advertisers attempt to do is to create a story that we feel that we can live out in some way. And what branding does um, also is to create this kind of totem, you know, so there's the there's the hill figure totem and the Benetton totem. And in some way, this totem is going to, to prescribe our actions because we've connected to the story that goes behind that particular lifestyle, the lifestyle that's, that's signified by that totem. So in the book, we cover quite a lot of the work of a photographer called um, Oliveira Toscani, um, who created the Benetton campaigns. And his technique was very, very simple. What he did was he identified this group of people as potential Benetton customers, and they were the people that were proud enough to think that they couldn't really be convinced of things by being uh, shown pictures of sexual objects or that kind of thing, but rather um, saw themselves as thinkers and people that associated themselves with the arts and um, with the kind of the abrasiveness, if you like, of everyday life. And he took pictures like that and he put Benetton on them, United Colours of Benetton. And of course, people did associate with that brand. The pictures, some people thought they were shocking. But, you know, it became a totem for that particular group of people. And one could guess that, you know, they, those people that were wearing the Benetton t-shirts were also taking their kids to the early learning center and buying them wooden toys and they so there was this there was this group and the, the, the Toscani actually provided them with a totem that would work for the early learning center provided them with a totem that went with that sort of lifestyle and you know there, there would be other um, parts of that lifestyle um, as well 
So um, Toscani really wasn't a black magician in the sense that some advertisers are. Um, we also look at the cigarette industry and how people sold um, tobacco products on the back of chocolate products. Um, that's really kind of black magic. Mm -hmm. um, um, where, where did the social politics steps in, in, in creating a mass persuasion? Because, I mean, uh, we related it with the psychoanalysis and magic, magic of photography or magic or the magical thinking and how we build stories or personal stories uh, through those magical thinking. But where does the social uh, politics or everyday politics steps in? Well, it steps in in round about turn of the century, really. The turn of the last century, not this century, the 20th century, because that was the time when this man, Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, was on a boat um, going from Europe into, into America. By the time Bernays was in his early 20s, the world was at war. Uh, but America wasn't in the war, and there was this huge problem, which was uh, how to get America into the war, because Woodrow Wilson, the president of the US, had uh, campaigned on the ticket of keep America out of the war, and then six months later he wanted to get America into the war. So Bernays had to find a way of justifying this, and he came out with a defense of democracy. America was coming to Europe in order to defend democracy and therefore offer some sort of freedoms to the relatives of people that were the um, American migrants um, who'd come from Europe in the first case in order to escape from various kinds of uh, oppression. So he invented this idea about defending democracy and then in 1928 he wrote a book called Propaganda in which he said that, um, and I can't quote him exactly, but he said to the effect that democracy was far too dangerous to be left in the hands of the masses. And actually there needed to be an invisible government that would direct how people felt and thought um, about both purchasing and about, um, and about politics. And some of those ideas were then taken up by Goebbels and Hitler and used in order to develop their propaganda for the Third Reich. So in terms of politics and psychoanalysis, certainly um, there's, there's a very direct uh, connection. You see, I think what had happened was that psychoanalysis